You're listening to the Colts Blue Zone Podcast with Mike Chappell and Dave Griffiths. Inside the Fox 59 CBS 4 Podcast Studio, welcome to the Colts Blue Zone Podcast. We are taping this on a Thursday, April 18th. That means we are one week, one week away from the start of the NFL draft. Three days, seven rounds as franchises hope to build toward the future. It's the one weekend where everyone gets to celebrate because everyone gets better, except for the New York Jets, because they always mess it up. But thankfully, we're here in Indianapolis, so you all don't have to worry about that as you're listening to this podcast. Alongside Matt Adams, I am Dave Griffiths. Our Mike Chapel can't make it this week. Uh, on the COVID-19 reserve list, now, that doesn't mean he has COVID. He could be a close contact, you know. But, but seriously, I'm so glad that I don't have to worry about any of that anymore. But Chap will be back next week, certainly, no doubt, as we get back to uh, to draft chat. Um, and no doubt we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be on Wednesday next week for sure, since the draft drops on Thursday. Give you all ample time there to, to get us downloaded, get us listened, and, and all perused up for the draft. We will talk a little bit about the draft today. Um, also, some happenings uh, at Colts headquarters as the offseason program has begun for the Colts and every other team across the NFL just this week. Uh, specifically, Matt, here in Indianapolis, we got our first chance to hear from the Colts as they all gather together. This this first session is not not an in-depth football um, learning uh, time together. It's basically uh, counting heads and counting noses and making sure everybody is back and everybody's in decent shape because that's what they do right now. It's strength and conditioning. It's rehab from injuries. It's uh, kind of to get settled and to get back in the swing of things a little bit in the very minor set and get back to work together so, so they didn't let us get in the Colts facility to watch guys lift weights and no. and, and, and you know do cardio because that's that's pretty much what it is uh, it, meeting rooms that sort of thing get acquainted see kind of what the team concept is uh, so you know it's still exciting because it means everybody's kind of getting the band back together but uh, there's not a whole lot visually from our perspective that is uh, from a fan perspective that you're going to get out of this. right yeah it would be exciting to see Quentin Nelson do some squats uh, no doubt uh, just to say yes they're back the horseshoe is back but uh, but yeah, not not too much to get excited about in terms of what's going on there. Of course, um, we'll, we'll anticipate to, to see Anthony Richardson uh, out there uh, working as well, and uh, and everybody uh, out there. And specifically with Anthony, it has to do with his uh, his rehab from his shoulder injury. And uh, we've already been told by the Colts brass uh, in, in recent interviews throughout this off season that um, that that he is progressing. That they expect him to be out on the field sooner rather than later. And, and as we talked. About about here on this podcast, Matt, that uh, to hear them say that is is a big step in the right direction, because if there was really any doubt at all, you would expect them to just be like, oh, there's no timeline, which which I've bemoaned on this podcast many times before hearing that there's no timeline because there's always a timeline, just that they don't want to share it with us. Um, But but the the fact that they even shared somewhat of a semblance of a timeline with Anthony Richardson in his rehab uh, should be encouraging over these coming weeks that hopefully when OTAs start up early in OTAs, not even late, not even at mandatory mini camp in June but hopefully OTAs in May is when Anthony Richardson will be uh, chucking it down there on the field when he's allowed to do so well yeah and that's I think that's great news for everybody because as Chap and I discussed a little bit last week uh, Dave of course on an approved vacation yes, last week it was uh, but as we discussed last week you know it this team by virtue of bringing back pretty much everybody with you know a few exceptions but bringing pretty much everybody back from last year's team uh, they have for the most part uh said, hey, we, we liked what we got, and we think that the quarterback position is going to be able to elevate our team. So they're going to put a lot on those broad shoulders of Anthony Richardson, and uh, we can only hope that he's going to be up to the task. And, and that'll be a topic that I'm sure we'll discuss much more in depth for as the season uh, gets closer. Uh, but, but the news of this week, we will begin with DeForest Buckner signing a two-year contract extension with the team through 2026. Buckner was going into the last year of his contract with the Colts, um, the one that he signed as the Colts traded for him a couple years back. Um, They gave up a first-round pick, signed him to an extension then, and made him really a cornerstone of the defense. Well, now he's not just the young cornerstone of the defense like he was back then. Like, what was he, 26, maybe 27 years old when he signed that deal? He traded away from the uh, 49ers because they were going in a different direction. Uh, Now now he's the veteran uh, of the defense. He's the guy 
um, that uh, that everyone goes to for uh, for kind of leadership on that side of the ball. And uh, and it's it's it, it, he's gone from one scheme with Matt Eberflus to the other in uh, in Gus Bradley and, and still been a, a vital contributor to the defense. And really, it's it's also a Chris Bowd style. I, d- I don't want to like both of those two styles are certainly different defenses, but there is an idea that Chris Ballard has on what the defense is going to look like. And, and DeForest Buckner is a key part of that. Obviously, so in this uh, two-year extension for him, Matt, as uh, the Colts lock up their their main front line contributor on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, Buck's been a team captain. Uh, he's one of the guys that everybody looks up to on this team. He's kind of uh, it, it was kind of funny. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, but everyone kind of looks to him as they looked to Philip Rivers for guidance when they called him Uncle Phil and his short time here with the team, and they were joking mm-hmm. about you know Buckner taking on the Uncle Phil moniker, and then I think it was Chap who pointed out maybe he should be Uncle Buck. Yes, because it was. Because it's, it's, it's right there. You know, it's right in front of you uh, because he is just such a, a guy who is so durable on the field. He's not missed many games here with the Colts, and uh, he's, he's just a, a tremendous player. And uh, you just are so happy, if you're a fan, to have him back. And, and I know that it's like, well, my understanding is, is this deal was a deal that helps give the Colts some flexibility and their salary cap, which they already had some, but this provides some more flexibility so they can still just kind of sit on that money and bank it. And and whenever you add more salary cap flexibility, that always, that should make the fans open their eyes a little bit and be like, hey, that means that something's going to happen, or at least there's an idea to make something else happen in the future, Um, that this is not like the end of uh, signing uh, players for now that, Chris Ballard has his sights set on some things to happen down the line this year, um, or at least a rollover salary cap to next year, which no, nobody wants that. I'll, I'll, I'll say that right away. And say, who, who else needs a contract extension it, exactly. is, is, is your first thought sometimes. Right, exactly. And it doesn't necessarily mean bringing people, uh, bringing people out from outside. It could be taking care of your own inside, which we saw the Colts do plenty this year. Um, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. But um, this, <clears throat> this deal really was – it was not totally normal for what we've seen Chris Bauer do mm-hmm. in the past. It was it was kind of different in that fact that uh, it re- really reduced this year um, Buckner's base salary to just two point five million dollars. This is a reported deal, I should say. Yeah, this this yes. is from the Indy Star. Yes, uh, this information. And um, and you can find it on Spot Rack, I think, or yes. on Over the Cap, or both. Really great resources for for salary cap. You can get kind of as little or as deep as you really want to go on both of those websites, which I think are set up pretty well uh, for, for either the guy who's just a little interested in seeing how the cap break down or, um, or really go in depth to see exactly how it matters from year to year and, and how, how the salary cap works. Um, but anyway, it reduces base salary to just two and a half million dollars this year, uh, but kind of converted his salary to a signing bonus and that money gets spread out. Uh, uh, against the cap for multiple seasons. So it takes down the hit this year, gives a little bit more. Um, it, the deal adds what are called voidable years, which essentially allow the team to spread that bonus cap hit over time. And uh, that gives the Colts about $28 million right now in total salary cap space and uh, $24 million in effective cap space. And that accounts for the draft class. So, and and that in. is from spot rack and over the cap there right. on, on that stuff. So, yeah, it, it's just kind of one of those, those moves. And we don't really see the Colts. We've seen the Colts restructure guys contract and, and reduce the cap hit, but we don't usually see the voidable year part that right. really takes that bonus where if they decide to part ways, let's say with Buckner early out of that contract, they're still on the hook for some money in like 2027 and 2028. We don't see a lot of deferred money right. from the Colts. So, you know, it's an, it's an interesting move in that way. Right. And with Buckner, uh, he spoke with us this week, a couple of the, one of the several Colts who, who did so in the first, uh, First time for us in the media to get to speak to them as they were back. Uh, Buckner said it was an easy decision to stay here in Indy. Uh, he, he's glad to get the contract done because that's that's going to be a topic for every guy who has one year left on their contract. Now, it was last year for Kenny Moore. You know, it was last year for Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor, obviously, we all saw how that worked the out, big one. So. Yeah, that was fun. Let's not do that again. 
But um, but Buckner, it, it's done before it's an issue, which is fantastic, which I love because I hate dealing with those issues. You know, you want to deal with football. You want to talk football. You want to talk X's and O's and who's starting and what matters. And you don't want to uh, have salary issues looming uh, over an entire season. For Buckner, it won't. Uh, he's had last year's near playoff run, showed the team is going in the right direction. And for him to stay here also, like it's obvious that you have some kind of faith in Anthony Richardson. If you're a guy who's at the age Buckner, is who's signing probably his second or third to last contract when they get to this age you're signing two or three year extensions for the most part so uh, he's in he's into his 30s now he's on he's over the hill in NFL terms you know you're seeing the back half of your career instead of the front half and by that time you're thinking more legacies you're thinking obviously getting as much money as possible which every player absolutely should but also wanting to go somewhere stay somewhere in this case that that can win games because you want to win too you, you want to get there you want to get into the postseason because you want that mm-hmm. shot at getting that ring and he had a shot at the Super Bowl with the 49ers they fell short so him staying here you know does tell you like you said he, he's got some faith in the franchise's direction he's got faith in the quarterback that they've uh, drafted last year and even though he's coming off the, the surgery uh, he being Anthony Richards not not Buckner uh, and then it was interesting I think one of the the reporters asked him you know what what do you think about doing something like you know Stephen Gilmore did where he was toward the end of his contract things did not work out mm-hmm. unfortunately he was one of their best players on the team that right. year but it was a bad season he wanted to go somewhere that where they can continue because he did not think the Colts were going to be there at that time. Now, as it turned out, the Colts were, but it, it surprised everybody. Let's let's mm-hmm. be perfectly honest with the Colts even being within a, a breath of getting into the playoffs last year. And, you know, Buckner said, yeah, I could have asked for a trade or I could have waited till the contract expired and signed somewhere else as a free agent or, you know, gone into some sort of uh, intensive negotiations with the team on what he wanted to do. But, you know, sometimes the grass is greener on the other side. You don't know. Maybe this situation looks good with this franchise, mm-hmm. But then it doesn't work out yeah. or they change their defensive system and it doesn't play to his strengths. So, you know, he knows what the Colts are doing here. They know what kind of player they have in him. So it's just it's a good situation for him. Right. The grass is not always greener. And for Buckner, he knows that he thinks that there's plenty of green grass here. Again, that, that should be something encouraging that a guy like that uh, thinks that much uh, about what's going on. Uh, so uh, so that's Buckner. Um, other players who talked are Ryan Kelly, Dallas Flowers, Michael Pittman Jr., Zaire Franklin, and, of course, head coach Shane Steichen as well. We'll kind of go down these guys one by one. We'll start with Ryan Kelly because he's in the same situation that DeForest Buckner is going into the final year of his contract. And uh, if you all remember last year, at the end of the year, there was some type of question or a report, excuse me, a report, that uh, Kelly was considering retirement and Kelly in no uncertain terms very much shot that down and said that that is not what going on between his ears uh, at all at least right now so if it was at some point if the report was right let's just say that at some point he was thinking about it he's not anymore Uh, he is trying to stay he is trying to play as long as he stays healthy uh, he will be in the NFL and he will be probably going to he's probably going to be a Colt because last year he had a very good year, Ryan Kelly, um, and it was better than his previous couple of seasons. He was healthier. And I think you can speak to the uh, change in offensive line coach that everyone uh, gave tons of uh, per- tons of credit to Tony Sperano Jr. and the job he did with everybody last year. But, uh, but Ryan Kelly praised the entire coaching staff, um, saying that he wants to work with Anthony Richardson, of course, uh, but he does want a contract extension. So uh, that'll be something to consider. And now that there's a little bit more flexibility in the salary cap with, with Buckner's deal getting done, uh, now there's a chance for, uh, for – well, there was, was before a chance for Ryan Kelly if there was already like – 20 between 20 and 25 million dollars of cap now like i said there's 28 with uh, buckner's deal getting restructured um so what was i gonna say yeah uh, ryan, ryan kelly may be next on the docket uh, here matt as uh, as chris ballard turns his attention toward toward what to do next this offseason yeah and it, it may not even depend on whether or not he has a, a good season here they may not be t- taking a wait and see they may decide to extend him because you know a couple years ago that offensive line had been great and then and then they weren't all of a sudden they had a, a terrible year and then last year they rebounded and even with a, a lineup that was a little bit patchwork at times you know not always the same guys always in the same spots they still performed pretty well mm-hmm. as a unit they were rated very high uh, by pro football focus and, and things like that and Kelly kind of regained form there at center this year so he's a very valuable piece 
if he wants to stay, I think the Colts will keep him. Like like Buckner, he's a team captain. He, he's one of the leaders, again, who's been around this team for a long time. He, he was he was a first-round draft pick of the Grigson era, for crying out loud. Like yep. That's how long he's, he's been around here. He, he uh, was drafted because they needed better linemen around Andrew Luck, if you can recall. Yeah. <laughs> He, because there was so so much of a center carousel in front of Andrew Luck, they're like, finally, we've got the center. We got the guy. We, we've got it. We've got our battery for years to come. Wrong. Now there's been a quarterback carousel behind Ryan Kelly for the past decade or so, uh, or past five or six years or so, ever since Andrew Luck retired. Luck was back, by the way, in town last oh, yes, week. Oh yes, yes, I meant to um, mention that. Yeah, and, and, uh, he's. Uh, so we might as well talk about it now. But but he looked good. He looked happy. He looked sprite. Um, he, he was very excited to be to be back here in Indianapolis, um, and he was back for uh, the Chuck Pagano, the the annual uh, gala they do um, at at Colts headquarters, the Chuck Strong Gala. And uh, but but he spoke. He looks good. He he's happy. Uh, he's not playing football anytime soon. Thank God that 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 those persistent hey Andrew Luck, Andrew Luck, Andrew Luck is uh, is is gone and in the past. But um, but it was it was good to see him back. Um, and it's just like to to see Andrew Luck back in a Colts setting is I think a step toward full healing with this franchise, Matt. Yeah, I, I think so because, and Luck's a guy who just doesn't really do a whole lot out in the media. I mean, he's just kind of living his own life. He's with his wife and his kids. Right. Uh, I think he's been uh, doing some schooling. He's been doing some like part-time coaching uh, at, on the high school level and stuff like that. And we just don't really see him that much. I mean, when he appeared, what was it on prime fo- uh, prime football on the Thursday night game, he was, Captain Andrew Luck, he just right. sort of randomly showed up. And sometimes Luck does stuff like that. But as far as like just appearing in public and appearing and doing media interviews, just not a guy anymore who wants anything to do with that. So it was nice to see him back, like you said, bringing a little bit of not necessarily some closure, but some healing, uh, making some steps toward maybe getting back involved a little bit with the franchise. Yeah, he's not going to be a guy like like a um, like a Gary Brackett was, you know, for yeah. and who was always a kind of in the public eye, even after retiring or a Marlon Jackson, who's still in the area and kind of in the public eye. Um, from from time to time, like he he's gonna he, he's always gonna be more reclusive in that aspect. But um, th- there will be a time when when Andrew Luck goes up in the rafters at at Lucas Oil Stadium as, as a member of the um of the of the Ring of Honor. Um, but it just it's gonna take some time just because of the way everything ended. But like I said, good <clears throat> good to see him back, and he's happy, and the team was happy to have him back. Of course, there's there's never been any problem with with Jim Irsay and, and Andrew Luck. He was. He was he was not happy to see him go by any stretch right. of the and imagination. He, he always but held was, on to that hope, right? right that, but, that we're going to be able to coax him to come back. But, but there was no bitterness like there was with a lot of the fan base, and I would say justifiable bitterness for the way everything went down. And I know that there's arguments for both sides, and I know we've hashed them out both ways. But now that now that he's back, it's just at least a, a mention in the show before we uh, before we really move on to to other topics. And uh, that that stems out of Ryan Kelly and Ryan Kelly uh, uh, back with, for another season with the Colts. Dallas Flowers, um, the cornerback that no, we're not really mentioning when we're discussing the, the future of cornerback, and that's because he played a couple games last year and then got hurt and was done. Uh, so y- you saw progression from other young guys like uh, Juju Brents when he was on the field, like Jalen Jones, but you didn't see Dallas Flowers take any real significant steps forward because there were none to take. Uh, he was hurt. He was out. Uh, he says he's pleased with his recovery from his injury so far. Uh, likes the depth in the secondary, feels the unit has a lot of growth, and uh, also was asked about the new kickoff rule because he was the Colts mm-hmm. kickoff one returner their, a couple years returners. ago. Yes, uh, he was, I think two years ago, he maybe led the NFL or was one of the top uh, kick returners in the NFL uh, in his rookie year when he was an undrafted kid uh, out of Pittsburgh State, the Gorillas, Division II school. Um, so so anyway, Dallas Flowers is, is a really unique um, uh, X factor is maybe a too strong a word because usually that, that implies will certainly make an impact beyond what uh, like uh, make a significant impact and one beyond what you would expect. I think Dallas Flowers could make an impact beyond what we expected. I don't know how significant it's going to be this year, but uh, depending on the draft, of course, and uh, depending on the health of everybody back there, he, he could see more significant minutes again on the outside this year, Matt, because you're, you're going in with still two with J- Jones and Brent, who I mentioned earlier, who are going into their second years. Um, they're they're no different really in their development than than a Dallas Flowers is right now. They've both been in the system for like a year playing the system, I would say. And and they're kind of all I would think on a very much level playing field in terms of 
Like, I, I don't know who is going to get uh, the inside shot at really the second job. Because I, I would say Juju right now is probably penciled in as a starter as long as he's healthy. He was the second round pick last year. But, but uh, opposite him, like, you got obviously Kenny Moore on the inside. But it, it's a wide open battlefield for who's going to get that, uh, who's going who's gonna to start, I think, opposite Juju Brents. Um, and and you pre- maybe throw in a rookie in the first round as well. And I, I think Dallas Flowers has, has, has as good a shot of anybody is what I'm trying to say. Well, he, he's athletic, and he, he kind of just played his way into the lineup. And, and that's that's what you like is is they, they had, you know, not great uh, cornerbacks before, and he was able to, to, to get in there and, and make an impact on the team. And then, of course, you, as a bonus, got the return game on top of that as well. And so, no, you're right. I mean, maybe they've got the most tape on Flowers because they didn't get a lot of tape on Juju Brents because he was not in the lineup consistently last season. But then Jalen Jones played almost every game. or I think he did play in every game mm-hmm. last season. Um, so, And then the other thing you get concerned about with, uh, with Flowers is I believe it was an Achilles injury right. that he came off. And sometimes those guys getting that explosiveness back – uh, the year afterwards is really, really tough. Yeah, it, it depends on the guy. It depends on the mm-hmm. injury. I mean, that's the injury that um, that a couple people had. It's what uh, it's what Julian Blackman had, uh, and it's what um, who else had? Dangbo. Yeah, Dio Dangbo. You're right. Had the Achilles injury, and like you can you can definitely see that Odangbo is mm-hmm. is he better. That extra yeah, time, exactly. Because he this made a year. big a, a big leap mm-hmm. in and, his second time. And part of that, you know, part of that is just development as a player, True. but also it's it's getting fully back from that injury. When you're older, and this happens, I remember Eric Fisher, who came in as left tackle back in 2021. Like he did not, and you'd think, well, why does offensive line need to explode? Well, you're trying to get back and, and block and pass protection. You need to explode out of your stance and get back. And, and he couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and that's why, <clears throat> that's why after that year, like before that year in 2020, he was a Pro Bowler, and the Colts signed him, knowing that well, he's trying to get back from this injury. But that's why he hasn't played in the NFL since yeah. 2021 just, because just didn't get it back. Exactly, he he did not have it. The Colts tried and it didn't work that year with him. Um, but but anyway, Dallas Flowers being a young guy, you would optimistically say that hopefully he can be back but uh also say that it might take some time like it does with a uh, dial a, a, as an example of another young guy and and Ju- julian blackman uh, who certainly had a very good year last year um uh and i can't remember when his was his achilles at the end of two years ago was it like he he, it I, might I, th- be his, I think his Achilles was the pro yeah, injury that he had because I think, so I think the one coming out of college was, ACL. was the, was the right. ACL. Right. Sometimes so. I get that uh, transposed in my head, but I think right. that's the and I think that's I, I think so too. Um, but but anyway, so that that's Dallas Flowers. Um, again, a guy that I think you can be optimistic about, but not someone to say that oh we have Dallas Flowers, so we we shouldn't draft a cornerback. Obviously, no, it's, it's like solid player. Yeah, but. it's 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 like saying oh we, have, we, we, we oh, well if you're a Colts fan saying oh we have Jelani Woods, we shouldn't take Brock Bowers in the first round. We take someone else that, 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 that no 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 okay like that you, you they have they have some talent in these rooms these guys are decent players but they're not anything to keep the Colts from trying to get better specifically in the draft which we'll talk plenty more about next week uh Zaire Franklin another captain Syracuse University's finest uh three-time captain of Syracuse University by the way doesn't happen very often when that happens Matt just so you know um uh, Zaire sees the defense improving this next season uh he gave a shout out of course to Buck for his est- extension Happy to have uh, Kenny Moore and Julian Blackman back. Um, there's plenty of camaraderie in this group, for sure. They, they like each other. Uh, now they just need to kind of uh, take their game to the next level. And really really what they're missing now, they're, they're missing – they're missing something that Shaquille Leonard brought, of course, in, right. in his best yeah. in his best years, Matt. Like Zaire, Zaire is as steady as they come at linebacker. He is solid. He sticks his nose in everywhere. He gets more tackles than anybody in the NFL when he's out there on the field. The only reason he didn't lead the league last year is because he missed one stupid game, and he wasn't the league leader that reason. But he has set now the Colts record in back-to-back seasons for single-season tackles. Zaire is as steady as they come. But those forced fumbles or interceptions don't seem to come his way like they did with Shaq from time to time. They do with even with EJ Speed uh, gets a couple, not certainly at the level of Shaq, but but that's the one thing I think that Zaire can take his game to the next level if you could get in on some more of those, quote, splash plays. And it's something that the Colts need more of on the defensive side of the ball. And that will kind of uh, impact 
what I think the Colts are going to do in the first round of the draft, which we don't need to discuss right now, which we'll get to eventually. But um, but that's but but Zaire again to hear from Zaire. It's all, I, I love seeing Zaire obviously because he's a fellow Syracuse University and Philadelphia guy from Philadelphia. Um, but uh, but he he's back again. You expect him to be nothing else but the steady player he is and continue to be take a leader more of a leadership role on that side of the, uh, on defense. And it, it's just and you guys talk about it all the time, but it's always great to hear from Zaire because you know some of these guys. Although I, I really do think of, of the guys that they talk to uh, coming off the off season activity stuff. Uh, they all had something to say this time, but that's not always the case, especially when you get into the grind of the season. Zaire's a guy who always seems to have something to right. say. Yeah, he, he's uh, and, and fortunately, there's like with him, unlike some of these other guys, there's no real serious offseason storyline with Zaire. Well, he got his contract. Yes, he got um, his, his extension. Yeah, that, that's already done. Um, so so he was like the first one to get done. Buckner got done. Ryan Kelly, perhaps one of the next ones to get done uh, as well. Uh, Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, speaking with us says Anthony Richardson's going to play 17 games and more. And he hopes and more and more <laughs> and more and more. Shan to Colts fans. Yes, we'll see about that this year. That would be fantastic. Um, <clears throat> happy that the rent a QB era is over. Says he believes Richardson's running ability will lead to some explosive RPOs, and and that's uh, we've talked about that in here before. Like to to have Anthony Richardson, and Jonathan Taylor on the field for a grand total of two plays last year was le- left just left the Colts fan wanting, le- yes. left you wanting more. And and you you see both players what they can do, both of those two guys, and both of their explosive ability. And and that that should leave you excited for what's to come. But it's it, it's all potential right now, which is like just like the draft is next week. Kind of like I was saying earlier, every every fan loves the NFL draft because it's all potential. You come away from it feeling great, feeling that your team certainly got better. And, and you go into if you're the Colts in this scenario with Anthony Richardson and, and Jonathan Taylor, you go into next season. You have to feel optimistic about what they can do together just because you've seen both of them. Yeah, Richardson a little bit. Taylor a whole lot more, obviously, by themselves. You've seen how explosive they can be. Throw them together in the same backfield. And like Pittman says right here, um, they should be able to be explosive in the RPO game. And that should be a lot of fun for them, uh, for, for Colts fans to watch. Uh, and he says, don't sleep on his passing. Uh, the Colts, he says, will uh, be able to attack outside more than in recent years. They better because Richardson has mm-hmm. a stronger arm probably than um, than their last quarterbacks back to uh, the old CW mm-hmm. uh, the who, combined. Who he mentioned uh, by name, obviously, mm-hmm. in, the, uh-huh. in the rundown. It's an mm-hmm. inside uh, joke on the show uh, yep. about Carson Wentz. But, that, yeah, he mentioned right. Wentz by name. He said Carson had a great downfield arm. And that's, mm-hmm. we also have mentioned that before on the podcast, that when it came – there's always that question, can Pittman go downfield? The season that he showed, yes, he can, was when he played with Wentz. He made right. some big plays downfield because Wentz had a big arm. Mm-hmm. And now he's going to be with a quarterback who's similar. Yep, and there are some times there, like Pittman, Pittman had just as many big plays as he had plays where he drew pass interference down the field too as well because like he's a big dude and he's a strong guy. So if he gets into good position – quarterbacks are going to have to take him down, you know, in order to prevent longer plays. Um, and, and so that's that was that was a part of his game that year in 2021 that has not been used since. And there certainly is the potential for it to blossom once again with Anthony Richardson throwing the ball. Um, let's see. What else here? It says Buck has taken over the Uncle Phil team dad role. Well, that's what, who it came from specifically was yes. uh, Michael Pittman Jr. saying Uncle Phil. And like you said, uh, our very own Mike Chappell, uh, may he rest up and see him next week um, the, saying call him Uncle Buck, which for all you youngins out there listening to this podcast, if you are unfamiliar with Uncle Buck, uh, as soon as this podcast is done, you need to find where it is streaming online and rent Uncle Buck and and sit down for a couple hours. So and make sure it's the movie with John Candy and not the terrible TV show that they tried to cash in on based on the movie. Exactly. The TV show with the legendary, not the TV show, sorry, the movie is what I meant with with uh, the legendary John Candy. Um, so that's uh, that's from Pittman. Uh, Shane Steichen. Uh, Steichen uh, comes up and right out of the bat saying he has two rules, Matt, two rules for Shane Steichen. One, be on time. Uh, unfortunately, we are starting this podcast on time. I, I'm always close to on time when I come. When I come, usually I'm pretty much on time. Chap's always here. I'm, I always come in, and you and Chap are sitting down. You're ready to go, but I, I stroll in and like, all right, fine. Stars here, guys. Here we go. Time <laughs> now, to go. Now we can all start right. The thing. Yeah, where's my latte? All right, here we go. Um, but but anyway, number two rule: treat people with respect. Uh, so those those are Shane Steichen's Say, we, two we, rules. We flaunt rule number two. We a do little bit. quite quite a bit. And uh, but but nevertheless, it's it's all in good fun at the end of the day. Um, uh, Steichen says Anthony Richardson's in a really good place. 
with his recovery, because obviously that's always going to come up every time that we see Steichen or uh, or Ursay maybe with the draft next week. If he's healthy and up to it, we will see. Uh, when we talked to Chris Ballard, one of the first questions is going to be about Anthony Richardson and how he's doing until we really sit down with Anthony. I, I did get a laugh out of Steichen because, again, I think he's loosened up just a little bit. Yeah, here. I think so. We'll, we'll see how it goes during the season. But he said, I'm just glad you don't have to ask me why do you value in a quarterback for three months <laughs> leading up to the draft? Because that's all that we could do last year. Mm-hmm. And then one of the reporters immediately asked, what traits do you value in a wide receiver? Nice. <laughs> that sounds like, I don't know who it was. That sounds like a, who it was. It, it might've been Kevin Bowen, but I like, I don't know who it was, but cause I wasn't there, but it sounds like a Kevin Bowen question because he has asked for years about wide receivers and it's become a running joke with Chris Ballard, okay. uh, Kevin Bowen asking him about wide receivers. Uh, so, so yes, that if, if it was Kevin salute to Kevin, and if it wasn't, salute to whoever it was uh, who, who who brought that up, because that's pretty darn funny. Um, Richardson says he has much better foundation this offseason because everything isn't brand new, like the playbook and terminology. And I, I would liken that to Steichen's own scenario. Mm-hmm. Like, not, It's not all new for him either, which is probably why he's a little bit looser. I, he's think, a little so. bit more, I think that has a lot to do with it. Because, I mean, even when we saw him in his opening uh, press conference, I wouldn't describe that as a guy who looked really comfortable in his own skin. Like, he was confident. He was really trying but he just it was it was a very big moment for him and you could tell that the moment was big now I think this is all we got the year under our belt I've been the head coach I kind of know what I'm doing and we'll go from there yeah you could overemphasize I think that reality by saying he was wound up and I don't know if that's entirely true but he was certainly a little tight and and, sports fans will get that analogy if the pitcher is a little bit tight you know he still has his stuff but it's just not as precise right. as he should be out there. So so you would hope and you would think that this year being a little bit more comfortable and knowing what to expect with, with that knowledge of what to expect comes a little bit more stability and a little bit more uh, confidence in yourself and your ability uh, as a head coach too. Uh, it'll be good to see, as Shane Steichen says, again, AR and JT get used to one another, which has been a continuing uh, theme here uh, in this uh, uh, for us today excuse me i'm have like a burp that's halfway up and it's like staying there excuse me there it is i had to punch myself in the chest this is great radio let me tell you a great podcast whatever it is we we, we paint with words we do uh, so subscribe to the colts blue zone podcast get us downloaded to your uh, listening device as soon as it drops so you can hear ever, anything and everything that comes out of my mouth uh but but that's just the first week we'll talk to more players uh as the as the offseason goes on no doubt we'll talk to coaches too and i'm sure reggie wayne will be will be on the list of people to talk about we can uh, chat about uh about dwight getting into the hall of fame and uh, his no doubt disappointment but of course moving on and uh and seeing what there is uh and this will all come with assistant coaches probably more so after the draft because hopefully we'll be able to get their thoughts uh, on some of these players that uh, the Colts decide to bring in starting next week. And uh, that'll be fun to hear from them uh, about their thoughts. It's always good to hear from the scouts, too, who, who go out and, and like literally study these guys for, for weeks and months, uh, see what they saw, see what they think uh, about, about these players. That's always a unique discussion with them about what exactly stood out you know that that helped allowed them to bring it to then the attention of Chris Ballard and Shane Steichen and Jim Ursay to uh, to get them kind of on the board. I thought I found those uh, discussions really intriguing to see uh, to see how how certain players in the draft sta- uh, stand out. And of course, being one week from the draft, Matt, uh, th- this is mock season. Uh, they're they're coming out left and right everywhere. They're, oh they're, my gosh, they're everywhere. They're, there's final mock draft. There's final mock draft A. There's final mock draft one A two. You know whatever it is, like it, everyone has has their their final stuff coming out. As now, now you have the most information uh, as you're going to have. Like at, at the beginning of like January, February, when most people are really starting to get fully full bore into this. Like you just look at teams, you look at needs, you look at players, and you kind of paste it through that way. Well, now you have uh, teams that have been all over the place at certain pro days. Um, like like just a, a great example last year, the Raiders, the uh, the uh, Vegas Raiders had their offensive coordinator at Purdue's Pro Day, which I was at. And I remember seeing him there and, um, and talking to the Purdue, um, the Purdue SID, Sports Information Director, to make sure I knew who that was and was their offensive coordinator. And then they go out and they take Aiden O'Connell uh, in the fourth round of that draft. So, so you see certain people at certain Pro Days or talking with certain people at, at, um, at, C- at, what's it called, the Senior Bowl and all that, and uh, you get certain 30, top 30 visits, uh, teams bring in different players uh, to, to their headquarters, 
And so you get you get more information about who teams are looking at and what exactly they're interested in. So so drafts now obviously mocks are are much more much more information based, but it's also being mock draft season is also smokescreen season, of course, Matt. Absolutely. You never know what information is right and what information is wrong. And I, I certainly credit the guys who do mocks every year to try to sif- siphon through all this. Guys like uh, Mel Kuyper, who's done it forever, like Daniel Jeremiah at the NFL, uh, at NFL.com. Um, I, I, all, all these guys do a really good job. Dane Brugler with The Athletic does a tremendous job. because he, he the beast? He does the seven-round yeah. mock draft, mm-hmm. man. He, that, is, that is just insane. That is some commitment, Exactly. Man. It really is. Is to, to go to go all out but there's a market for it because the NFL is king and uh, as, as big a deal as uh, as Caitlin Clark is right here in Indianapolis right now just this week getting introduced with the Indiana fever um, and how big a deal that's going to be this summer man the NFL they could they, they do anything you sneeze and there's a there's a five page uh, story uh, on USA Today about about what's happening in the NFL so uh, so really eager to see what happens next week and, and to see something materialize out of all these months of um, for the scouts scouting and work and study and debate and uh, passionate back and forth uh, about these players and uh, to, to become a little bit more concrete and see exactly what happens it is always a really intriguing time that's why everybody loves the draft so really exciting to see what happens the Colts uh, we are tracking Colts.com track yeah, JJ from uh, Colts.com doing doing the the, the, the Lord's the work. work yes for exactly uh, for uh, he tracks 21 mock drafts um, for in in his most recent he does mock draft Monday kind of a roundup of of who the people uh, out there take um, are taking if you're, you're the Colts uh, and of his of the 21 mock drafts the JJ put together on Colts.com you can head there and read them but 11 of the 21. 52 percent that is have the Colts taking a cornerback because that's probably the most obvious Mm -hmm. need that they have you have talent in that room like we said earlier but it's a lot of young unproven talent and if you add a little bit more there maybe that's and there there's some decent talent um at cornerback in this draft that's not quarterback that's going to kind of push down some of the pretty good corners there in the first round you would think yeah and it's it's just kind of one of those things. I mean, one thing when I look through some of these mock drafts, and, and again, these these are people who you know study more football than than I do, but also maybe they're not. I'm not going to say I'm in tune with what the team needs, but I've also watched Chris Ballard draft for a long time. The guy has made I think it's 18 draft day trades in his years here. I don't think there are enough people accounting for a trade down from the Colts in this first round. Now, it could be because there is some unbelievable talent here. If quarterbacks, if there's a run on quarterbacks, if we discussed before, some of that talent then kind of drops to slots where you wouldn't necessarily have thought that they were going to drop. And maybe the Colts do stick at 15 and draft a guy. Uh, A couple of these guys think that the Colts may trade up to get Brock Bowers. And I just, having watched the Colts do that, unless they are just, 100% 100% all in on it. I just, it would be, I'd be very surprised if they did it. Right. I, I would too. I, I would, I would much, I would much more expect if they're going to trade up to trade up for a Romo Dudze or Malik Neighbors if one of those guys starts to uh, go, starts to fall a little bit in the draft for whatever reason. I, I would, uh, like Brock Bowers is, is, I think, a tremendous offensive player, but I do think there's a difference between a number one receiver and a number one tight end. I you, think there still is. You would rather have the Jamar Chase than the – I would rather have Jamar Chase at his best than Travis Kelsey at his best. Like, that, that's, that's how I feel. And, and I think that you could have a really good debate about that. But I think most NFL – well, I think most NFL scouts or GMs would agree with me because – Number one wide receivers are paid more. I say, look at the pay scale. Exactly, that, than the best tight ends in the league. Again, I think that this is like this is something that you could you could actually debate uh, the value of a, a tight end in the line in the um, tight end in the vein of, of Travis Kelsey or um, or Rob Kittle Gronkowski. Or or, like that, you know, yeah. um, rather than, Gronkowski might be might be the outlier because he was he was the best receiving tight end and the best blocking tight end in the NFL as Total long package, as he was healthy for, for years. What and, a monster! And with what the Colts want to do in the run game, like if you had a guy like that that would that would be an otherworldly uh, otherworldly get but anyway um t- 11 of the 21 uh, mock drafts had the Colts taking corner 15 of the 21 had them taking defense 
Uh, so that's 71% of them, and just six of them have the Colts going offense. And you have a good breakdown, uh, or <clears throat> JJ really has a good breakdown. Yes. You just copy and paste really well onto well, this paper for us. Thank I, you. I did go through and, and do the tallies. Well, good, good, good job. So, Matt. so that that was the the very very bare minimum of work that I did. Uh-huh. The, the one player who does get the most is Brock Bowers. So of the six times that these people, these mock drafters have the Colts going offense, five of them mm-hmm. have them taking Brock Bowers. Um, and that is if he falls, of course, to the Colts. So that would be probably assuming there's enough teams to trade up for quarterbacks up there and he falls. That's assuming the Jets do not take Brock Bowers uh, because I've seen him going to the Jets in a couple mock drafts who pick a couple before the Colts at 15. I think there are 13 or 12, somewhere around there. Maybe they're even at 10. But there, there, are, there are a couple of spaces in front of the Colts, uh, all that to say. Um, but if he goes, if he falls down to the Colts, certainly a legitimate consideration to take him. Um, if not, and if quarterbacks don't get taken in the top, maybe in that 15, 13 to 18 range, other teams are trying to trade to that range. And then the Colts I, will be very happy, maybe, maybe. I, I, I don't want to say very happy because I don't know for sure, but it depends on who's there. But I, w- I would imagine at that point, if they're getting quarterback offers for their 15th overall pick Chris Ballard based on what he has done in the past Matt it would be hard to imagine him turning them down going down to I don't know 23 to 27 you know in the draft and picking someone down there where he'll still get a good player that they've scouted and and that they like I think that depends on what their projection is on some of these guys but yeah if he can get an extra third round pick or fourth round pick or something like that trade down and and flip-flop with somebody in the first round that is just totally what the Colts have done. But uh, the second most uh, drafted player in these 21 mock drafts was Terion Arnold, the cornerback out of Alabama. There were four mock drafts that had him going to the Colts. I've seen him taken a couple times before the Colts and a few times after, mm-hmm. but mostly a little bit before. He's usually the first or the second cornerback off the board in all these drafts. A uh, young man out of North Florida, Tallahassee, Florida, John Paul II High School, and then went over to Alabama after that. Um, Arnold, like we... Based on our interviews, not one on one with him, but you you have those whole group settings at the uh, at the combine. He is he's a wonderful interview, like such a like it, he he lights up the room. You know, he's one of those guys. Um, Brock Bowers is not that. He's very like he 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 says a couple words and then he, he's on to the next thing. And, and and not that there's anything wrong with no, with that at all. And not that there's anything that makes one or one player a better player. But he's just he's fun to listen to. Is what I'm saying. I think Terry on Arnold would be a guy that Colts fans would love and a guy that would um, be be about more than football here and be um, be involved and be be a face of the franchise type guy uh, based on it if they get him and if he stays healthy, you know, and all that stuff. But I, I, he's he, he's a very intriguing guy to me, uh, if indeed the Colts would be interested in drafting him. Quinion Mitchell was in three of these drafts, uh, the cornerback out of Toledo, probably the other uh, cornerback between um, uh, him and Terion Arnold going uh, one, two, really, in most of the drafts that I have seen, at least those two guys, um, Cooper DeGene. Uh, from Iowa, uh, he's in two of these drafts. Jared Verse, defensive end out of Florida State, taken twice in these mock drafts, and then a bunch of guys taken one time. One is Renardo Green, the corner out of Florida State. One is defensive tackle Byron Murphy the second out of Texas. One is wide receiver Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU. And then one defensive end, Dallas Turner, out of Alabama, and one cornerback, Nate Wiggins, uh, yeah. I don't out know of how Clemson. I had D-E, uh, that is not correct. Nate Wiggins that. would not be a good no, defensive he end. Would not be, no, he is a cornerback. He is a, indeed a cornerback. Bad, Matt. Bad. Indeed. Shame on you. But um, anyway, uh, only three of these 21 drafts had the Colts trading down. Matt p- puts a note here, seems low, and I would agree with you. That seems low to me, too. W- w- just with the ability, with all these quarterbacks that are in the mix, and with some that you're not totally sure if they're top 10 quarterbacks, you know, a couple of them you're pretty sure. I think three or four of them you're 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 feeling good. You feel that the, those guys are going to get picked. But then there's two other guys, you know, or, or so that you don't know what other teams feel about them completely. And there are other teams that have that have needs there. So if you if another all it takes is one team to fall in love with you and move up for you. And we saw it, like I've said before, with Daniel Jones a couple years ago, how the Giants love Daniel Jones. They move. They, they got him. And um, and I don't know if any other team loved him as much as the Giants did, but they loved him enough to make the move and get him. Um, all it needs is one team to love Bo Nix, whether it's the um, like the Denver Broncos or the Raiders or whoever it is or the Minnesota Vikings. Like if they love him enough and the other guys are gone and they're like, we can't 
we can't lose out uh, on this guy. Boom, you make the trade at 15 with the Colts and you make the pick there. Well, and you could see, I mean, something happening where, like, for a long time it looked like North Carolina's Drake May was going to be the guy, one of the guys in the draft. And we've seen sort of a precipitous fall from him uh, over the last month or so. And we've seen J.J. McCarthy mm -hmm go up the ranks in this draft and it it can be befuddling uh, but it seems to happen every year but that could mean that a team has a good evaluation on drake may he does end up dropping and then they're willing to trade up and then that just sets off this entire domino effect of what happens in that first round all right we'll also remind everyone that this is smoke screen season we saw mm -hmm. a big last year with cj mm -hmm. stroud there was a lot before the draft yep. of seeing him kind of go down the boards and then he's taken you know uh in in at, at by the texans right there at the top and and you saw exactly what he did and there were there was no and i've said before that i think that i was more wrong about cj stroud than i have been about any draft prospect ever in in, in what i thought about him but um but yeah, you just you can't trust exactly in anything yeah so but it, it is interesting uh how, how these things can shake out yeah um and uh as we've said before on this podcast if you're talking about colts draft picks you need to talk about relative athletic scores the old ras and for cornerback, since that is the one position that is most drafted to the Colts uh, here, 11 out of 21, so half the people doing mocks think the Colts are going to zero in on corner. Uh, here are the RAS scores for these cornerbacks that uh, were uh, listed above for players the Colts might take. Uh, the, the top RAS score of these corners is Cooper DeGean uh, out of Iowa. Uh, his RAS score is a 9.85 out of 10. He's six foot and one half inch tall. He's 203 pounds, and he has 31 and a half inch arms. So he's the uh, the biggest in terms of weight out of all these guys, and that leads to some people thinking he might be might be a safety, a safety or a guy that can play down yeah, in the like box, a flex, a flex role yep, type of guy. Yep, or even even an interior corner as well. Which I'm going to say the Colts could use an interior corner, he not 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 Kenny Moore, not to replace Kenny Moore. But really, Tony Brown had been the backup for right. the last you, couple of years there. You would like to there. have something a little more. Exactly. There. So, uh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge about what Dave might be thinking and, about. And he who also, the Colts uh, take. The, the, uh, Cooper has the uh, a return game. He as, does. As he has well. a return that, that, game. That's a little asterisk that, uh -huh. that goes by him too. And he is a guy who is a ball hawk. He is a guy who takes the ball away. Mm -hmm. And you don't have you don't have what's his face uh, Shaquille Leonard back there right. anymore. You need guys to take the ball away right now. And uh, and you, they could be at any position. It doesn't necessarily need to be linebacker, but you need guys to take the football away right now on that defense. And you just don't have too many of them right now. So anyway, uh, all that to say, hmm, hmm, interesting. What does Dave think? Yeah. yeah. Quinion Mitchell uh, is a nine point seven nine in his RAS score. Uh, is a six Six foot tall cornerback, 195 pounds, 31 inch arms. Not that much smaller than, than DeGene, not no. not nearly. And had a really freaking good senior bowl. And for a guy from Toledo, you needed he needed that and, and uh, blazing speed. Exactly. As well, on yes, top of that. one of the fastest corners out there. Um, Nate Wiggins, I believe, was the fastest corner at 4.2 something at the uh, at the combine. But he did pull up lame there, so that um, he wouldn't do any more drills at the combine, unfortunately. But uh, his RAS score is a 9.44. He is six one, so he's the tallest member of this group, which I know that Chris Ballard values. Um, but uh, he's only 173 See, he's a pounds. Bit light. It's it's and so his, interesting. And his arm are only 30 and one right. half inch so he, he's a little bit small with his arms which is pretty important for cornerbacks as well Wiggins had a heck of a year at Clemson I don't, I'm not I'm not sitting here trying to trying to rip on him at, at all he, he, he did not give up a lot of receiving yards I forget exactly what it was but him and um who's the old one Terry on Arnold I think both of those guys whenever they were thrown at they held their uh, opponents to only like a 50 uh, quarterback rating or something and that's the one that goes up to 150 something not the QBR mm. that only goes up to 100 um, so they I think they they both had really good seasons but anyway here is Terry on Arnold a 9.27 on the RIS scale six foot tall 189 pounds 31 and five eighths inch arms so just a bit longer than that uh, Cooper DeGene uh, 31 and a half inch and uh, then you go to Renardo Green out of Florida State, an 8-2-1. I would be very surprised if the Colts selected him in the first round. Let me say that. Um, Six-foot-tall cornerback, 186 pounds, 31 and one-quarter inch arms. So and and, and I, I will just say that I've been tracking some of the mock drafts and also with help from Colts.com. This is the first time I can remember his name coming up in one of the drafts, uh, one of the mocks. Um, and I, I don't think there was a trade down involved in this one. Like I could see that if, if maybe the Colts traded down 
And, you know, this is the cornerback that they think's left to be there. Right. Uh, but I think this was an outright pick, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that, that again, would, would stun me if, if that happens. So somebody, somebody, one person likes him who's doing this mock draft. And that's what happens. And, that, like, and that's fine. I mean, everybody's right. going to, sometimes uh, the guys that do the mock drafts, they kind of have their own pet projects, guys that they just really like. And this may be that case there. And they may think it's a good fit in Indy for one reason or another. Exactly. So the NFL draft is one week away, begins on April 25th. It is in Detroit. The Colts right now have the 15th pick. And, and Matt, if you're talking about what they should do, if there's a good offer to trade down, excuse me as I burp again, heaven's sakes alive. Um, excuse me, everyone. Um, but I, I, I would be surprised. I would not be surprised if they trade down, if that's the choice, because I mean, we, we've even, we, we even debated about us going to Detroit for the draft and like, we, we just get unlucky every time we go. It seems like the guy is not there last year. We did for Anthony Richardson. Cause we knew that we would, we knew that we'd talk to Anthony or whoever the Colts would take, whatever quarterback it would be. But, but in previous years, like guys haven't been there. Like Quentin Nelson was, was off with his family. Uh, when when the Colts drafted him, they've traded out of the first round before, uh, like in the year when they uh, they moved down uh, with um, like they went down to the second round and drafted uh, Rock Yassin, like and the Commanders moved up that year. I can't remember exactly. They took Montez Sweat that year in that in that position. Anyway, uh, I, I'm going down a rabbit hole. But all that to say, I, I would be I would not be surprised if they trade back from 15, especially if one or two of the quarterbacks up there uh, do, do fall down to that range, and other teams are, are still in the looking in in look in seek. Excuse me, in search of a quarterback is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it, just as we've talked about before, depends on what the run is on quarterbacks. Uh, depends on if. Uh, some teams reach for some guys uh, that maybe the draft experts didn't necessarily think that they would reach for, then maybe the Colts do stick at 15 uh, because they're able to get a guy on their board uh, that they think is really good value for the pick that they've got. But I also know, as Chris Ballard has said before, he likes those picks. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see them, you know, trading, uh, making a couple trades during the draft, ending up with, I think they've only got seven draft picks right now, uh, one for each round. I could see them. I'll take the over. Yeah I, yeah, I would definitely see them trying to get, you know, nine, nine or ten picks out of this mm -hmm. if, if they could. That's, that's just what he does. Uh, build up the roster with young players, young talent, really athletic players, give them to the coaches and then see what they can do. That, that's that got to be, in some sense, what general managers and scouts should do get find athletic players who are smart enough to learn what they need to do and let the coaches do their job i, I will say though from a, a fan's perspective if the colts do stick at 15 and take a guy then 100 percent you know they're all in on that guy yeah because that means they're willing to invest they're willing to stick and, and not get that extra draft capital mm -hmm. it means they really wanted this guy I, I agree and that's what we saw a couple of years ago with quitty pay um they stuck at that position mm -hmm. took quitty that was four years ago again um that's going to be another decision that yes, we haven't talked about here, here. yeah a couple, a couple, weeks. couple of weeks i think it's may sometime may is 2nd. when yeah is when the colts have to make a decision on the fifth year in quitty pays contract there's a team option for a fifth year but uh, his salary of course goes way up uh for that that's uh, a, an option given for first round picks in the nfl draft uh for uh for player for players and teams that, that take them so uh, so we'll see if that's going to be something that materializes and uh, we'll see if the Colts take a player this year that uh, they're going to have to make a decision about in uh, you know four or five years down the road as to as whether they want to pick up an option but uh, that would be I, I think Colts fans want them to make a pick there you know because you want them to be mm -hmm. all in on a Absolutely. player Matt I get it uh, but at the same time if you move down like you you like I, like I said, I wouldn't be surprised, and I don't think it's the end of the world. Of course, that depends on who they take. You, you don't want them to trade out of the first round. No team, no no fan base ever wants them to trade out of the <laughs> We've first seen round. That a few times. Exactly, which it just makes you bang your head against the wall. Um, but there there there's not much that would su surprise me greatly. Like this is a really deep offensive line draft, so I like uh, that would surprise me a little if the Colts went offensive line. You know, but. If it's defensive end, they're trying to get after the quarterback more. If it's defensive tackle, that's to give like they they just signed Grover and Buckner, so maybe maybe not in the first round like the picks here with um with Byron Murphy. I I don't know. Like I was thinking earlier in the draft process that maybe that was a possibility, but after they re-signed both of their interior guys, I don't know if you spend a first round pick right, and they used on something on the one interior. of the few outside free agents that they brought yeah. in was an interior defensive line. Right. So I don't know if that would be possible, but like I can see corner, I can see like a Cooper. DeJean 
Jean, who also has the safety flexibility as well. I doubt they take another safety there. Um, although if they fall in love with somebody, they don't have a whole lot of safeties on the roster right now. You know, but but receiver, I could see it. It's not going to be a running back, obviously. It's not going to be a quarterback, but but it could it could be a lot of different things. Like cornerback is probably what you're zeroing in on. We'll discuss this a whole lot more next week. But but there really is a very wide range of possibilities for what the Colts could do in this first round. Yeah, I mean that's. That's why the draft is exciting, and, and, you know, none of these teams are going to, you know, somebody could go up to the podium and, and ask uh, Chris Ballard who he's going to pick. You're never going to find out. You're just never going to find out. Don't even ask the question. But um, th- that's what's exciting about it is you, you don't know what the team is going to do this year. And, I mean, it was exciting last year because you know where they're going to pick a quarterback. Mm-hmm. Like, it was going to be somebody. It was going to be probably Will Levis or mm-hmm. maybe Anthony Richardson. Mm-hmm. And uh, being Richardson, very exciting pick this year. I mean, goodness, yeah, if – Brock Bowers is there, go get him. Mm-hmm. But there are some very good wide receivers that they could also add that mm-hmm. at, at 15 or even if they trade down a couple of spots, mm-hmm. they pick up an extra pick and get a guy. Yep. Well, we'll be back next week to discuss all that. Matt, myself, and Chap, if he clears concussion protocol, you know, he, he has to get that final evaluation right. from, the, uh, from, the outside, uh, from the outside source and uh, has to not experience symptoms for, for 24 hours. And, and then finally, uh, finally, he can be cleared because of the, uh, all, all those rules to, to be back on the Colts Blue Zone podcast. But, um, but we'll be back before the NFL draft for, for one final draft preview. Um, and there'll be a lot to talk about because, like I said, there's a lot of options for, for the Colts to, to look at moving forward. So for, for Matt, I'm Dave. We do appreciate you listening. You can follow us on Twitter. Matt's at Statomatty. I'm at DaveG underscore sports. Do download and subscribe to get this Coach Blue Zone podcast delivered to you as soon as we drop next week and before the draft. And we'll see you next week for our full draft preview edition of the Colts Blue Zone podcast. <laughs>